and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall, and this time around, we've got this Croton watch. And Croton, Croton is a, a brand that exists technically these days, though, as far as I can tell, they just sell kind of cheap Chinese watches now. So maybe maybe a company bought the brand name. But back in the day, they made a lot of different watches. Uh, this one's a women's watch. It was actually handed to me by a family member. This watch belonged to her grandmother. And it's very old. Uh, as you can see, this watch, uh, I think it dates to the 50s. That's the best guess that I have. And it, see, it has this red symbol on it. And I actually had to look this up online and do kind of a lot of research to see what it was. I knew that this family member was in healthcare, And it turns out that that symbol is for the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Diseases. They've used that uh, logo since 1902. So for us, well, we've got a real challenge here. This is a women's watch, which primarily means that it's just smaller. That That's the main thing. Let's see how it runs on the time grapher to kind of get, get things kicked off here. Um, so smaller means a little trickier to work on, no doubt about it. And this is a, an important heirloom for my family members. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I take good care of it and then it runs well. So let's see how it's doing. Well, not great. Um, honestly, this isn't that bad for a watch that probably hasn't been serviced in years and years and years. Um, but, you know, running three or four minutes a day over is kind of a lot. 168 degree amplitude is low-ish. And the beat error of three milliseconds is, is pretty far off as well. Although, again, I, to be honest with you, I kind of would have expected almost for this to be worse. Um, but it's pretty bad. Definitely the watch could use a service. And uh, we're going to get into this thing. Now... Again, the challenge that we're facing here is, is twofold. One, the watch is old. Uh, this is a significantly old watch, and we'll find out more about it as we uh, work our way through. But also, it's small. Um, yeah, it really does make a difference. Uh, you know, when I first started learning, um, I was taught by Mark over at the Watch Repair uh, channel here. He has a website called watch, watchrepairlessons.com that I've mentioned on the channel a few times that I've taken the classes on. And they were great help to me. He has you start out on a relatively large movement. It's a 6497 or a 6498. And those have been made by Chinese companies uh, more recently for cheap, but also, of course, ETA or Unitas makes them. And those are bigger movements that are a little easier to kind of see and get your hands on and get the tweezers into. But this one, as you can see, is quite a small watch. And it's also built a little differently than the watches that we normally work on on the channel here. For example, the case here is just sort of pushed together, two-piece kind of a clamshell thing. It's not actually a pressed on back. So straight away, it's kind of tricky to uh, to get that out of there. But as you can see, it does come off. And you can see the case is actually quite thin. It's also plated gold. And gold plated means exactly what you think. It has a thin layer of gold plated on the outside of what they call a base metal. Base metal is like a cheap, durable metal. And that does kind of limit what you can do with these as far as restoring them. But we'll get that ca the case cleaned up and stuff anyway. And there's the back. I'm looking for uh, markings in the back of the case there to see if any other, perhaps if any other uh, watchmakers had been in there. I don't really see a whole lot though. So here's the movement. Now we can just uh, take the hands off. And as you can see, I mean, it's not very big. I prefer to use these hand levers in conjunction with some plastic bags to take off the hands. You can use what they call a Presto tool as well. And those work pretty good. But I find that I have more control with the hand levers, so I prefer those. So taking a look, the watch is running, but I, <laughs> I can't help but notice just how small this movement is. Everything's just sort of packed together. And just to give you an idea, that's an Omega Speedmaster, you know, one of the more popular sports watches <laughs> around. It just dwarfs this little tiny watch. But nevertheless, we must press on and start disassembling this thing to see what is going on with it. So first I'll take out the crown and stem and then we'll work on getting the dial off. And so far everything looks about the same as I would expect uh, from a watch from this era.
Nothing dramatically changed because of the size. As you can see, this dial is in pretty rough shape, but I don't think that there's going to be much I can do about it, and I certainly don't want to make it worse. So I'll probably just leave it like that. I think it adds a lot of character to the watch myself. And we can start disassembling. Of course, we need to take off the cannon pinion, and this is my preferred tool for doing so. It makes it a snap, and it safely removes the cannon pinion without bending anything, mainly because it can pull that cannon pinion straight in the air, and that's really important because it sits on a very thin pivot there, and if you twist it to the side, it'll bend that pivot, and it can either break or just get bent. One little trick with these um, movement holders as well is they actually are two different sizes. You can turn them over, which I just did here to reveal that this side's actually uh, got smaller opening on the top, so I can put the movement in there. I'm happy to see that this watch is running. That's a good sign. So first things first, let's get the, uh, the balance out of here. Now, one thing that you may notice if you're sharply looking. Uh, for, first things first though, before I take the balance out, I've decided, you know what, I better uh, wind down the mainspring here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I move the click out of the way so that the mainspring, which is in that barrel there, can actually unwind. And I do so. And now I can actually take off the uh, balance. But look at the balance jewel at the top. What you'll notice on the, on the top part there that I'm taking off is that it is not shock protected. Most of the ones we have have a very small spring that goes on top of that jewel and protects the watch if it were to be dropped and the very delicate pinion that sits on top of that balance. A pinion is like a, uh, in this case, is like a, an axle. But imagine a very thin axle on a very large wheel. <laughs> you wouldn't want that being tossed around in the, in the event that the watch was dropped on the ground. And that's exactly what happens if you drop your watch on the ground. It's a lot of mass that pulls to the side and can easily break. And so, you know, at some point in history, I think in the 50s, 60s, somewhere in that range, it started to become pretty standard issue to put those, uh, those springs on, the balance jewels and some of the other jewels too, depending on how much uh, pressure they can take. Well, this one doesn't have it, which kind of dates the watch back even a little further. Maybe the 40s? Wouldn't be shocked. Okay, so now we can start taking off the crown wheel and uh-oh. Well, there's definitely some rust under the crown wheel, and that means that there's probably going to be rust elsewhere. Um, it does seem to be kind of more like rust residue rather than actual rust, so perhaps we'll get lucky there, but yeah. And now I need to take off the barrel, and I just realized two things. One, that screw was very brittle, and two... I turned it the wrong way. Uh, this one is actually a right hand thread and I gave it just a little bit of a turn to the left and it just snapped right off. So that tells me a couple of things. One, well, I'm still learning. <laughs> and two, that, um, you know, this watch is quite old. Uh, the, the screw broke very easily. And so that is something I'm going to have to address as we go further. But as it stands, it's time to just move on and uh, keep taking apart the click works here. And you can see the screw head, or not the head, but the, the main part of the screw still in that hole there. And that actually goes into the barrel arbor. So we'll have to address that a little bit later and see what we can do about it. Um, because I can't reassemble the watch without that, and I don't know how the heck I'm going to get that uh, the screw out of there. But like I said, we just sort of have to move on here at this point and keep disassembling the watch. I mean, this thing is clearly in dire need of a cleaning at the minimum. So now we can take off the barrel bridge. And again, you see some staining and some perhaps rusting. Yeah, they're on the bottom as well for the keyless works. It seems pretty obvious at this point that some water got in where the crown and the stem go in. Um, 
maybe multiple times or maybe just once, but it definitely rusted parts of the keyless works and even worked its way onto the barrel bridge. This rust could be really bad. Um, it also might be more of the kind of staining variety where it just doesn't look great, but it didn't actually hurt it uh, functionally. And we're going to have to clean these parts up and find out and maybe have to get some replacements if those ones need it. All right, so now we can take off the, uh, the train bridge and that's gonna reveal the train of wheels to us. And I can get the pallet fork out of there while I'm at it. So let's get to going on taking apart the train. And there goes the barrel. We're gonna take that apart in a minute and we'll examine and see what we can do about that barrel arbor with the screws still in it. But we do have one last component to take apart and that is going on top of the escape wheel here. And we see another non-shock jewel that, that sometimes will be a shock jewel. Okay. So all in all, you know, there's no date on this thing. There's no extra functionality outside of just time only. And this wasn't too bad of a, a disassembly outside of the obvious broken screw situation and the rust. Um, those are the two things that kind of stand out as need to be fixed or addressed. There's a setting lever, by the way. But otherwise, yeah, this thing's coming apart just fine. Thank you very much. You can see the movement number on there as well. It's AS970. And this is a small movement, but it I looked it up and uh, it looks like it was used in multiple watches. AS, I believe stands for A Schild, which is uh, I think a German, it might be Swiss, but manufacturer of movements back in the day. There's the yoke spring coming out, and that's just going to leave us the last of the keyless works here with the uh, with the yoke. All right. So as we work our way towards getting ready to put this thing in the cleaning machine, we want to put the balance back on, and this is done to protect it. Uh, the balance, of course, is a very delicate part. As I mentioned before, it's the part that can break if you drop the watch. And we'll get a view of that, of the balance a little later as well. But we put the balance back on before cleaning so that the spring is secure as well and doesn't get caught up on anything or tossed around. Now here's the, uh, the barrel arbor, or the barrel, the mainspring barrel. And uh, so we need to disassemble this, which is the, the main, the cap there that you can see on the tap on the top, the arbor in the middle, the spring, and then the barrel itself. That's what makes up these. And to get these apart, it's a little finicky because you don't want the spring to all come unwinding at once. It could damage it or just go flying or I don't know, it could hit you in the face or something. So you just want to be a little careful with that. But it's not too hard to get the the main spring out. And you know what? This one doesn't look like it's in bad shape at all. I tend to reuse main springs on uh, vintage watches when possible, just because it can be so hard to find one's replacements. And uh, if they look good like this one does, I'll reuse it. Now there's that barrel arbor right there. Now everything goes in the basket and here it is in the cleaning machine. It'll go through four stages, a cleaning, two rinses, and a drying cycle before it's done. And now it's time to address address the rust situation. So I got this stuff called evaporust. I don't never used it before, um, but we're going to see how it works on some of these rusted parts. So 
So I just took some of the parts that had some rust staining or rust on them, and I'm going to throw them in here for a few hours and just let them sit. That's what it says to do on the bottle. And when I come back, I can also take a piece of peg wood and get a little bit of abrasion going on here just to see if I can't clean up some of these parts. It seems to be doing a little bit, but I wouldn't call it a miracle. And here's, I think four or five hours later. And there's some improvement, but as you can see, not great really. Uh, there's still significant staining. Some of the rust is still on some of these parts. And let's get it under the microscope to take a quick look. And again, this is kind of a mix of staining plus rust. But, you know, really what you're looking for is where the metal has severely deteriorated. And it doesn't seem to be the case here. It looks more like uh, discoloration than anything. And that's the barrel bridge. There's the yoke. Now, that actually did get cleaned up pretty well in the rust remover. Again, there's some staining left over. But you see that there's no, like, actual rust on there. Same thing here. This part looks good. That's the setting lever screw, and it actually came out nice too. It's all dark. I don't know why it got so blackened, but it's not rusty anymore, so I'll take it. Here's the setting lever, and again, same thing. You see the colors on there and such, but not actual rusting, although while I was under here, I did notice that the setting lever, that top part, looks like it got blown out by something. I'm not really sure what's going on, but look at that. So this is going to need to be replaced as well, because there's no way that that's going to hold in. And again, these parts actually came out pretty good. So evaporust, yeah, you actually did a pretty good job. These look pretty darn good under the microscope. Okay, so we've got the parts clean, and the movement is going to be ready to get worked on, but I needed to order some parts for it or uh, figure out what I was going to do there. And I figured I'd work on the bracelet and the case and the uh, crystal while, while I was waiting for them. So again, this is gold plated, which means you can't do a whole lot. But look at that crystal. It's got some pretty serious dings in it. But I should be able to take care of this very easily. Uh, there's a product called Polywatch, which is made for these plastic, you know, these acrylic crystals. And um, basically, it's just a, a polish, you know, so you can put some on here and then rub it with a polishing cloth or really any clean cloth and just give it a good rub. And it'll uh, these things clean up beautifully. I love acrylic crystals. They uh, m most of my vintage watches have them and uh, I love them. I think they add kind of a warmth and they're usually domed, which adds like a neat kind of magnifying effect to it. And so I'm going to start going to town on this and get this thing just looking perfect. But it's not really coming off, and so I have to do it again, which is actually rare. The poly watch usually does a pretty good job, but it's actually still not coming off. So I'm going to do it a third time, and taking a good close look, it doesn't really seem to be disappearing, and I just have to go in for a fourth time. This is the first time I've ever had to do poly watch four times, and the dings are still there. I realized after I took the crystal out, <laughs> it's glass. <laughs> I actually thought I tried it out, but it's actually glass. So it's just going to need to uh, either be replaced or we're just going to have to live with it. In the meantime, uh, lessons learned again. Um, we're going to go back and uh, let's get the reassembly going on this thing. Now, here's what you really need if you're working on vintage watches. That is a donor movement. I went on eBay and I actually just found another of that AS970 movement. This one was even on another Croton watch. As you can see here, uh, maybe even the same model as, as the base. And I snapped it up and uh, it got delivered to me. And this is a godsend. This is what you need when you're working on a watch that has some damage to it, like we saw. So first thing I'm going to do is very carefully take off the uh, <laughs> that screw there by screwing it the wrong way, as it were. Because that's the main part, of course, that we need. We absolutely have to replace that. But, you know, I got to say, after having gotten in here... There's probably some other parts that we need as well. Um, so I'm going to get in here and take this thing down and at least get the, uh, the barrel and barrel arbor out because I may need to use the barrel arbor as well because remember, the other one has the screw stuck in it still. So I'll probably just use both the screw and the arbor from this movement. And that means I need to dig out the barrel arbor here and then I need to take apart the barrel and this one actually has a broken mainspring if you caught that really quickly. So again, donor movement, but that's where you want to be. So here's the new one. 
and then the old one that has the uh, screws still stuck in it, and I'm just not gonna have to deal with that. There are a few ways to take those screws out, but uh, looks like for this one, the donor movement to the rescue. So with that said, let's see if we can't get this barrel back together. This is a, a mainspring winder here, and I'm just picking the right size. This is really a great tool to allow you to reuse those mainsprings, especially on old watches. A little bit of Mobius 8200, just a thin layer on my glove here or on my finger cots. And I can just rub it along the length of that spring and that gives it just a little bit of corrosion protection. It's not really about lubrication as much as just uh, not letting the thing stick together and not letting it uh, get in, you know, if it were to get any moisture in it or anything like that. So now I can use my mainspring winder to safely wind back in the mainspring. Now what this does is it puts it into the end of the winder and then, then that allows me to push the whole wound mainspring in one fell swoop into the barrel. It can be a little tricky to get that last little tab in there, but there we go, we got it. And then carefully remove the winder. And as you can see, there's the mainspring all set in there and ready to go. I'll just use a little bit of Rotico to clean it up just in case there was any leftover grease or anything like that. And we are all set. Now this, for those of you that watch the channel, know that this is like the best sound in watchmaking. Just listen to this. Oh God, I love that. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, yeah, okay. So back to business here. There is the arbor from the donor movement. which we can set into place here. And that of course means that we need to put the cap on. And I got this little thing off of eBay. Bergeon makes these, but um, you know, most of the time I highly recommend getting the tools that the best tools that you can afford because God, it really matters. I know people say that all the time. It really does matter. But with this type of thing where it's just a piece of plastic, I just say get the cheap one from China. It's fine. Like that thing doesn't have to be perfect. But when it comes to the tools that you use all the time, like your screwdrivers, your tweezers, even the mat that you work on, I really do recommend just trying to spend the extra or save up a little longer to get the good stuff once you're kind of on a roll with the whole watchmaking thing. All right, main plate back on the holder. Let's take the balance off just so that it stays safe. And I wanna just do a quick test fit here. And yeah, everything looks good with this. This arbor seems to fit in. It isn't shaking around too much. And that means we can move on to the train of wheels. So we'll start with the escape wheel, which if you remember, has its own little bridge. And on top of that bridge, there sits a jewel. And it is, uh, as you can see, kind of a capped jewel. So I oil, I have to take that off to clean it and then oil it and then screw it back on. And now I can put the, the little bridge back on on top. Of course, always trying to be extra careful here. These pivots are very, very small. You just want to take your time. And you'll know. You'll know when that thing spins freely. And I finally got it down. And watch how, spree how freely these things spin once they're in the right place. Like I'm having actually a hard time, so I'm just going to use a blower. Watch this. See that? That's air moving that. And that thing is still spinning. So yeah, that's how you know it. you've got a nice kind of frictionless fit, if you will. So now we can put the fourth wheel in, which engages with the escape wheel. There we go. And the third wheel. And there's the center wheel. I'm just gonna put a little bit of Mobius 9010 on that, or uh, excuse me, um, HP 1300 on that before I put it in. That's just the name of the lubricant. There's usually only three or four that you use on a watch, at least at my level. I'm sure uh, people that work in 
uh, you know, real watchmaking shops probably have access to a few more. But even then, I, I've looked at the diagrams and stuff, and most of them call for three main kinds. There's usually a uh, very thin oil for the very fine parts. There's kind of a medium oil for the medium stuff. And then there's like a grease for the heavier duty stuff. There's a few specialty oils that you need for different parts as well, but those are the basics. All right. So the train wheel bridge can go on now once we've got everything lined up. As you can see, I'm just using a piece of pegwood to gently hold it in place while I uh, get the screws ready. And that's just because when you do finally get those pivots in the pivot holes where the jewels are, you don't want to accidentally bump something and move it off and then try to screw down the train bridge because if it's crooked, you could break one of those quite easily. And as you can see, I can just move the bridge and then it moves all the wheels down nice and smoothly and that's exactly what we want to see. So this thing's coming around. Put a little bit of grease on the uh, setting lever screw here and you put that on before the barrel on most of these type of movements. And as you can see, this, uh, this barrel bridge is pretty stained up, but as far as I can tell, it's functional. So I'm just going to stick with it because it is the one original to the watch. And if, you know, all things being equal, I'd prefer to use the one that's original to the watch. Now, if it's non-functional, I'd rather have a different one because you know, I'd rather have a working watch. And I, I want the owner of this watch to be able to enjoy it and to wear it. Okay, so let's get this bridge tightened down. And I'm going to use a little bit of that 1300 here on the barrel itself. It, th these movements usually don't come with a jeweled bearing there for the barrel. Some movements do, but that's usually on a, a little more high-end watches. And they're not 100% necessary, but that is metal on metal, so you want to make sure that you lubricate it. Now we can put the ratchet wheel on. This is also a left-handed, a left-hand threaded screw. So both of those on top are, usually just one is. It's usually that one, but this movement, it's both. Now I can get the click works ready. This is a very simple mechanism that lets you wind up the watch without it winding down. And that's the actual click itself. It just actuates on that spring that I put in first. And it's really one of the simplest parts of a watch. A very basic component, but effective. Just like we like. Now the ratchet wheel can go on. This is actually kind of an interesting part because it actually engages with the barrel arbor. That little part that we replaced is square on the top and that's why you see the square opening on the ratchet wheel so that it can uh, twist it without just spinning. And once again, these are both left-handed screw, uh, screws. So you'll see me turn this in the opposite direction that you would actually expect. It looks like I'm untightening it, but I'm tightening it down. Okay, now we can flip the movement over and get started on the keyless works. And I've already placed in the, um, the sliding clutch. And now I can put in the yoke. And the yoke spring. Again, just using a piece of pegwood to try to hold it secure and carefully putting it in place. There we go. Don't need anything flying off here. 
that's the 9501. So that's the grease that I mentioned. Uh, it's a little, it's thicker, you know, it's, it's a, it's an oil that's a little bit thicker and I actually put a little bit too much on there. So I'm just going to use some Rodico to clean it up. You don't need very much. Um, most people, when they start doing this stuff, put way, way too much on it. The challenge is actually to put on a smaller amount than you think. But you'll see some of the beginner watchmakers of which I'm, you know, somewhere in that range, but they, they'll just douse the things. And that is actually worse for the watch somehow than having none. Because if you put too much on, especially on a pivot, it won't suspend. The oil actually stays in the jewel hole. But if you put too much in, it can actually run out the bottom and then you'll have no oil there anymore. So it's, it's actually important to put on a very small amount, which is kind of counterintuitive. You'd think a little more, a little better, but it's not how it works. All right, last parts of the keyless works going into place here and we are cruising. This little cover plate has the spring for the setting lever, and it also just kind of holds everything in place. Again, a little bit of that grease uh, going on the winding stem here, because these are, at least as far as watch parts go, pretty heavy duty. Uh, you know, these are some of the bigger, beefier parts in the watch, and they're acting on each other pretty, pretty hardcore. So yeah, some grease. And we can test it out to see if I can wind up the watch and if I can get it into the hand setting position as well. Again, a little bit of grease. In fact, a little too much on there uh, on the oiler. So I decided to go back and try that again. There we go. And as you can see, the wheels turn there when I wind it up. So that's a good start. But when I try to wind it up and make it stay, they, it keeps unwinding again. And I'm like, what is going on here? So I'm gonna take off the ratchet wheel and see if the click isn't working properly. And if you look very closely, you can see the spring for the click has gone by where the actual click is. So that's not right. So I need to reset that again. It's supposed to push on that little click and make it so that it can't go back. But when I move it back on the other side, the click just simply moves back over it again and something's not lined up here. And I don't know what it is, but when I look closely, that's the post that the click goes on. Okay, so that's the screw goes into that and then the click sits around that post, but it felt loose. So I decided to put it on the microscope to see what the heck was going on with this and check this out. Look how loose it is tons of space around the click and that means that it can flop around and it won't engage with the click spring consistently. I'll even put the spring back on or excuse me the screw back on and we can see what happens. Look at this. See how much play that has? That's way too much so that spring can't stay touching on that click and then the click isn't doing its job. So I can wind up the watch but it just unwinds immediately and that's not good. So I'm going to grab the barrel bridge from the donor movement and see if it has a better fit. And it does. Look at that. That's how it's supposed to look where it doesn't have all that side play in it. So this is great news. And again, this donor movement is really coming handy because that's this whole entire plate. Now look that I have it installed. See, now the spring doesn't go by. Now it will actually actuate on that thing and do its job. And I've reinstalled it now and check it out. When I wind up the watch, boom, boom. And that's what the click does. And then when you stop winding, it grabs the, the, the teeth there and it won't let it go. And by the way, if you've ever wanted to see what happens when you wind the watch, that's what happens. Yeah. So there you go. The donor movement. It is a much needed item on repairs such as this in some circumstances, particularly on a watch that's in not such great shape like this one. So thank goodness we have that. And now we can uh, continue with the build.
So now we're going to put in the pallet forks. And there's the little bridge for the pallet forks. Similar to the um, escape wheel, just trying to be extra careful because you screw this thing down too soon and you do take a decent risk on breaking it. In this case, I'd probably just grab the other one, but I don't want to do that. So get it screwed down. And that's what we want to see. It's clicking back and forth after having wound up the watch a little bit. And that means that we can put on the balance. So we're kind of uh, moving right through this thing. Had to replace some parts. So it's definitely in a little bit of rough shape. But you know what? Donor movement. We're doing it. All right, so let's see if we can't get this balance on here and seated properly. It doesn't seem to want to start up, but it's also not fully in there yet. And there we go. It's running. Of course, that's always what you want to see. All right, now let's get just a, a shot of, of getting some of these oils. And you can see about how much I'm trying to put in. That's it. That amount that I put in is it. That's all I want in there. And it's really a very, very, very small amount. And that's why I do it on the microscope. I just wanted to give you a quick look at that. Now we can put this uh, extended seconds wheel. This attaches to the gear train through an extended pivot, meaning just like a long axle would be a good way to think about it. And then it runs the second hand that goes around on your watch. It's funny, this thing I'm putting in here, this long pivot. So on the top of it, it has a little pinion that engages with that wheel. The other end is just a stick. And on that stick, you actually stick the seconds hand. It actually goes on to that. So that's what you're doing there. And then just to keep it in place, there's this little placeholder spring thing. I'm not really sure what it's called. But it's very, very thin and very delicate. Now I can put the hour wheel on. And I also got a new little spring there that makes sure that the hands stay engaged with the hour and minute wheels. And then we can put the dial on. And the hands can go on. And you can see hand setting seems to be working okay as well. And when your watch doesn't have a date, it doesn't really matter what hour you set it to as long as it's on an hour exactly so that the time will show correctly. And just a quick test to make sure that the hands aren't touching and that they line up properly. Seconds hand needs to go on as well. And that's the original bracelet there. And now I do need to address this crystal because as you can see, it is really banged up and it is glass. 
and I need to replace it because th that makes a huge difference to how the watch looks and uh, kind of the overall presentation of it. And I just don't want to return this watch with that. I mean, a crystal's in really bad shape. So we got to measure it and we got to put it in an order and wait for the crystals to show up. But when they do, it, it'll be worth it. So here we go. This thing measured out at 180 or 18.1 millimeters or so. So I got 18.1, 18.2 and 18. And I'll just pick the one that fits best because now yeah, you never quite really know. But I got one size bigger and one size smaller just to be sure. I mean, the crystals, they're not particularly expensive. So it's usually just worth the time, if anything, to just order the bigger, smaller. And then, I mean, for this one, I don't really need these extras to be honest, but you know, you can start to build up a little stock of them. So this one's definitely too small. It just comes right back out. And these are just pressure fit in. There's no special, you know, way to put them in. You can If you can snap them in with your fingers, great. If you need to use a press or something, you may need to do that, which is what I had to do for this one. But eventually I got it to sit in there nicely, just like that. And look at that. I mean, it's so much better with the new crystal compared to the, with, the, with the banged up one. And we can get down the final stretch here and start putting this thing together. Doesn't seem to be running super great, but it is still going. And there we go. So just about finished here. Take a nice look at this thing, cleaned up the case a little bit and it's beautiful. Uh, it's actually a gorgeous little watch and I'm a big fan of it. Um, this isn't the end of the story though. So I put it back on the time grapher and it wouldn't even read the beat rate error. So what we're doing here is looking down, I, this is so hard to see, I know, but we're looking down at the balance to see where that jewel sits. It's called the impulse jewel and it's supposed to sit right there between those two posts at rest. And instead it's sitting almost on the entire opposite side, which is really not good. So I am going to now do the best I can to try to fix this. Now, I know it's a little bit off camera and I do apologize, but you see that I'm moving the whole assembly around after having taken the balance off and that shifts the position of that jewel. Now, this is something I've never done before and it's on an extremely small watch and on one that's really important to somebody. So I am being as careful as I can and not trying to push my luck too much, but I just didn't want to send it back to her with it being that far out of uh, beat it was barely running as a result and this the you can see that the the main spring or excuse me the hair springs a little bit beat up but this is the best i could get at least without going too crazy now you can at least see the jewel and admittedly it is not dead center between those two posts but it's pretty good and i got it to within one millisecond so i improved that the amplitude is now up to 226 from 170 so that's much better the timekeeping, okay, I got it to within 30 seconds a day and I have to live with it. Last little thing is <laughs> all of a sudden it wouldn't whine anymore and I noticed right there, look at that, one of the teeth was bent on one of the wheels. So once again, guess what came to the rescue? You guessed it, the donor movement. And I was able to grab that part and replace it as well. So this watch ended up being quite a journey. The first time I manually adjusted the beat rate error because it doesn't have a beat rate corrector on it. I got a new bracelet for it, as you can see, uh, that, that was a little more adjustable so that the owner could actually wear this watch when she wanted. Um, I replaced five, six parts on it, the crystal. Um, I cleaned up the case a little bit as well. And uh, it's running again. I got it again to within 30 seconds a day, which admittedly isn't spectacular timekeeping, but for a watch of this age, I am totally willing to accept it. I got that beat rare error down to just one millisecond, which again, you know, on a fully fledged new watch, that wouldn't be good enough. But uh, for something like this, I think you take what you can get from it and it's pretty darn close. And um, I think 
think she's going to be really happy with how her grandma's watch turned out because now she can wear it and it keeps really good time. It really does. That 35 seconds is maybe not even indicative of, of what I've seen from it. So really great uh, to work on such a special watch. Um, you know, that really means something to somebody and put it back into service. That's what this is really all about at the end of the day is, is making these things that aren't working, working so that people can enjoy them. Speaking of enjoying, I hope you enjoyed the video and hanging out with me for a little while here. Um, I've really appreciated all the support that everybody's given for the channel, all the new subscribers and everything. Thank you so much for hanging out and, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.